uh, last webinar, uh, we, we saw some basics and primarily we were focusing on evaluating the person, uh, uh, filtering the person, the right person to uh, get the raised wheelchair and then uh, doing other uh, activities like measurement and uh, getting a lot more data so that the wheelchair can be uh, well fitted to them. A well fitted wheelchair is very important that uh, we saw and hope everyone had seen the arrays uh, video also an uh, orientation video so there we have given uh, things uh, as clear as possible we are just going to uh, browse through what we had seen last week we had seen about the wheelchair we had a small demonstration of about uh, how the wheelchair works and we had seen about uh, various parts i think the video also has sh uh, shown various parts uh, uh, which work in uh, sync with each other in the wheelchair and uh, what I have given here is a list of all the parts if somebody just to refresh your memory. So we'll be using these terms uh, very frequently in the upcoming uh, 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 this session. So the, uh, the there's a backrest, this uh, chest strap for safety purpose. Uh, there's armrest for leaning onto the wheelchair when we need more support. There's a, a cushion which is designed to be a good, safe and positioning cushion. And there's a knee block, which is the primary uh, device which prevents a person from uh, falling down or uh, <coughs> preventing any kind of danger from the uh, standing process. And the support rest, which holds the feet securely. And the ankle guard prevents the ankles from sliding front or back. And uh, we have rear wheels, primarily, they are used as a drive wheels for propulsion. And uh, we have caster wheels, <coughs> sorry, caster wheel. There's a single caster wheel, extended one, which uh, is aimed at. Uh, maneuvering very rough terrain and providing a lot of stability and finally there's a weight assist uh, which is one of the integral parts which makes the whole process easier this being a manual uh, standing wheelchair the weight of the person has to be matched by the manual components if it's electric no issues but here to make the standing experience uh, a desirable one and an easier one we'll have to adjust the weight assist next we saw about uh, the sizes and the adjustments in the wheelchair um, so the video also tells this clearly. So there are uh, five different widths of the wheel, sorry, four different widths of the wheelchair, 15 to 19. And uh, there are uh, multiple adjustments. So we can adjust the backrest height, we can adjust the seat depth, uh, we can adjust the knee block uh, length and height. This is the knee block. So we can make it longer or we can make it taller. We can increase or decrease the footrest height we can move the center of gravity back or front according to the mass of the person and according to the propulsion. And we can increase the gas spring, we saw that earlier. So there are uh, adjustments which are a set of adjustments are available, but there's only one component, the seat width alone is not adjustable, but we have different sizes. So we'll have to, first priority will be to find out the exact size and fit the person to the size, and then the remaining things can be adjusted based on our assessment data. Seat width is a very important parameter. It should not be too narrow, it should not be too wide for the person. And then we saw uh, the assessment process which we had uh, designed for this uh, uh, standing wheelchair clinical program. Uh, we received a lot of feedback, we'll be incorporating changes soon. And we saw the basics you know, of the new assessment and then we saw about assessment of the importance of bone metal density and we saw about assessing tone and muscle power, muscle tone and muscle power. Uh, we saw about assessment of range of motion and tightness contracture deformities. We saw about assessment of cognition, we saw assessment of limb length discrepancies in the thighs and the legs. And we saw a brief of uh, MAT evaluation, mechanical assessment tool. And then finally, we uh, saw how to summarize the assessment and determine the eligibility from what problems had been found. And then we uh, saw measurement, uh, how to do measurement for the hip width. Uh, for the measurement for the thigh length, measurement for the knee length, the leg height, the knee height, the back height, and the intercondylar distance. These data, the assessment and the measurement in together with the person, with the user's, prospective user's preference will uh, be used to prescribe the wheelchair. So this will be very critical to the fitting process. So now, now we have seen, uh, we just refresh our memory and uh, we'll uh, uh, go into the actual uh, fitting process, uh, which is required for this standing bridge. So from the uh, data, what we have arrived, 
probably we can write it on a notebook we can give it on a computer but all that will not do the job those are just for recording those are just recording tools a very uh, heavy use of clinical judgment will be involved here but what we have made is we have created some resources so that people can use the resources as a rule of thumb and get a hang of the process so this this fitting process comes with experience and uh, learning from experienced people uh, so we have created some tools to make that learning curve a bit uh, smooth and flatter a lot of clinical judgment will be used in this so first let me give you an uh, orientation about what are the various uh, components and considerations we'll have to uh, use during fitting of each and every uh, part of the wheelchair or each and every adjustment available in the wheelchair and then we'll go about doing a demonstration with the wheelchair which you have there and with the model who is present with you. So first thing, the important thing will be finding the seat width because once you order, it will be a hassle if the, we get a wrong seat width and then we'll have to send it back after sitting on the wheelchair. So finding the seat width which should be very important. So the picture shows the width will be the overall space of, uh, which can be accommodated by a person. And it will be determined by uh, the lower body width. It can be the, if the thighs are wider, it can be the thigh width. If the hips are wider, it can be the hip width. Uh, if there's some deformity like abduction, deformity, uh, legs are uh, positioned in abduction, strip in abduction, then it will be that width. Uh, so <clears throat> things to consider here will be to, we'll have to take the measurement from the hips, thighs or distal thighs. And if somebody uh, is keeping on increasing weight, then that should be the first consideration because once a person keeps on putting weight and if it increases the width of in the last we can track the record of the person weight record of the person for the last three months uh, that will be a good uh, rule of thumb so last three months to six months will be a good rule of thumb uh, so we can uh, check whether the person is keeping on increasing in weight and accordingly give it one size or more or take a decision that this person will not put so much weight even if the person put so much weight it will not be gained in the area where the seat width is going to be affected. So we can make that uh, data point to uh, arrive at a uh, judgment. And uh, next will be orthosis. If somebody wants to stand on the standing wheelchair with orthosis, or most of the case, it will be a prosthesis. We have still not experienced those kind of uh, persons. And this is relatively new to the market. Think, uh, so situation might come up when somebody has to stand on this with orthosis, has to stand on with this prosthesis. It has to be done very carefully. And if there's a device, then we'll have to make it a little more, uh, again, we'll have to increase the width. If the person is wearing orthosis over the uh, body of the person, then we'll have to think about increasing the width. And the, actually the measurement should have been taken with the orthosis. That will be the best way possible. Otherwise we mostly can predict how thick will be the uh, aluminum uh, uh, sheet or whatever uh, plastic part socket. Uh, we can predict that and we can add that to the hip width. And um, yeah, we talked about weight gain and uh, and then we'll come to skin uh, condition. If somebody had uh, recurrent uh, ulcers or red sores in the greater trochanter region, then uh, that person should not be given a very tight fitting wheelchair, which is commonly seen in a regular wheelchair. Somebody, uh, some, uh, some persons can opt to sit on a like snug fitting wheelchair, it's not tight, it's not squeezing, but can sit in a snug fitting wheelchair. But here it should not be done so because these skirt guards or side plates, you know, these these skirt guards and side plates, they will move, they will uh, have uh, friction against the uh, greater tocant skin over the greater tocanter and it will erode the skin. So if somebody had recurrent greater tocanter ulcers in the past, then we should be careful to give more width. Based on whether it's one side or more, uh, two sides, we can take a decision over there and based on clothing. So in some places, people wear thick clothing uh, in winters. And uh, some people have the habit of wearing loose clothing, like uh, free flowing clothing, like saris or skirts or uh, other stuff. Uh, so based on that, we'll have to, again, determine the width. We'll have to give more width if somebody's wearing thick clothing. Along with the hip width, we'll have to uh, take the, add the width of the thick clothing to that. And um, if somebody's wearing very free flowing clothing, probably it will be better not to use them uh, while doing standing on the wheelchair but if it is uh, if they have to do so then we'll have to make them an option give some belt or something to keep the clothes tucked in or maybe give a bigger size 
again our subjective judgment and the person's preference will play a role here so next we'll move on to fitting of the seat belt <clears throat> so this will be derived from uh, the measurement of the uh, distance between the real most point of the body the uh, posterior uh, uh, buttock area to the popliteal fossa to the anterior wall of the popliteal fossa and uh, this distance sometimes persons can have limb length discrepancy that should be considered uh, if the limb length discrepancy is not too much say if it's not more than uh, one inch or something then we can still use this wheelchair uh, we haven't uh, uh, practically done some adjustment or fitting but still uh, we correctly assume it can be done once we get such a person in hand then he'll be able to clearly tell what can be done so if the LLD is in the LLD of the thigh or the femur, if it's less than one inch, I think it's definitely usable. And we can take the um, measurement of the uh, lowest limb and then create a seat depth for that. We can take the measurement of the highest seat depth and then the lower uh, the limb, which is shorter by one inch, will uh, not be fitting. There will not be any gap between the seat and the uh, person's leg. So based on the LLD, uh, we can take the measurement of the lowest limb and then uh, make the seat width accordingly and if somebody wears an orthosis it's better to uh, take the measurement with the orthosis all the orthosis or maybe give some more extra clearance if they don't have it while coming for the measurement uh, next is knee block length uh, the measurement and fitting uh, is very similar to uh, seat depth we are again measuring the femur length but this time we are not measuring till the popliteal posa but we are going to measure uh, till the petal lapa or the petal tendon so that measurement uh, can be directly used to derive the knee block length. Uh, for the seat that we usually reduce some um, uh, uh, one or two inches for clearance, but here we don't reduce anything. We keep the same measurement. And um, we uh, after the knee block is kept, we usually look for clearance. There should be, uh, there should not be any gap. There should not be a lot of gap, but there should be adequate uh, clearance so that the foam padding sits well. It should not be squeezed so that the, when the person stands, it's not uh, uh, compress the knee of the person a lot. And here also some one inch of LLD of the femur can be considered uh, to be uh, doable. And uh, again, if somebody is wearing an orthosis or process and they have to use it on the wheelchair, then we have to make some, we have to take special precaution and make some special considerations. The measurement also should vary. <laughs> Next, we'll uh, go to the foot test height. So, in the footrest, uh, we have uh, three or four um, holes uh, to take the footrest up or down. So based on uh, uh, the measurement, we can adjust the footrest. And the things to consider here are, uh, we'll have to consider the uh, height of the uh, lowest uh, leg. Uh, usually it will be other way in uh, regular wheelchairs. We'll consider the highest and then we'll uh, fill the padding on the lower side, but here it's different. We'll get to that when we look at the demonstration. So we'll have to, uh, if there's somebody has an LFD of <coughs> one inch or lesser, we can take the measurement of the uh, lowest uh, leg and uh, proceed with the uh, proceed with the uh, adjustment. And if somebody wears an orthosis, again, maybe give so much extra, uh, add that extra height, or maybe take the measurement with the orthosis. The second case will be the better. And another thing to consider here is if somebody wears a shoe or a sandal or any kind of footwear, we'll have to add the height of the sole, especially at the heel region. So we'll have to take that height and add it to the leg measurement and then uh, calculate the measurement of uh, how the footwear should be adjusted. If that is not suitable, if it exceeds limits, probably we can ask the person to change the shoe. Because some people wear very thin half an inch, quarter inch sole. Some people wear sport shoes, which are very thick and high. So. It can go up to even one, 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 three fourth of an inch. So that may not be good uh, if the person is already tall. <coughs> and then uh, we'll have to uh, consider the height of the compressed cushion in the front. So it's, uh, uh, yeah, the front portion of the cushion, when it's compressed, it goes compresses to a certain height. We'll have to take that measurement and adjust the uh, height of the, adjust added to the, uh, sorry reduce the height of the leg from that. So when we take the measurement 
uh, without the cushion, without the person sitting on the cushion, and we make the adjustment on the footrest. After we introduce the cushion, when the cushion compresses, the legs will be hanging. That should not be the case. So we should take the measurement of the compressed cushion and uh, subtract it from the measurement of the leg. And uh, we'll have to consider uh, adding the height of some postural support device, especially given on the feet, uh, to this leg height measurement. So if somebody uses a PSD on the feet, like a um, inversion, plantar flexion correction thing, then we can add that measurement to the leg measurement. And uh, <coughs> next is the uh, foot crest angle. So it basically comes from the range of motion assessment and the foot pair worn. Uh, if uh, somebody has uneven ankle range of motion, like uh, one foot is in zero degrees of uh, flexion, other foot is in uh, 10 degrees of flexion. So I think we can uh, go with the least one. We can go with the zero degree. If it's negative, then we'll have to give a partial support to this. We'll see that in the demonstration part. Basically, the feet have to be uh, at least flat. If not dorsiflex, at least flat on the footrest. And uh, yes, so in order to give footrest partial support devices, when we find the tightness contraction deformity assessment over there, or when we find range of motion restrictions so during the assessment, uh, we can take a decision based on that data. If uh, somebody's feet are not yielding to neutral, it can be either in the coronal plane, which is inversion aversion, or it can be either in the sagittal plane, which is dorsiflexion plantar flexion. So if that is the case, then we can think about uh, uh, adding um, a partial support device so there are a lot of uh, possibilities we can make one customized beneath the shoe or there are 3d printed parts which i've seen i had one good picture but uh, i didn't put it here so we can think about uh, making a customized partial support device to fit persons whose pa or uh, feet is not yielding to neutral if it's not coming flat then we can think about that um <clears throat> yeah next we'll move on to the height of the knee block. Sorry, the picture is not very clear, but if we can see the silver color rod, uh, this has many holes and uh, this can, it's telescopic, it can go up or down. If it goes up, then it fits a person with a taller knee, uh, longer knee, knee length. And if it's, um, if it goes down, then it will fit a person with shorter knee length. So basically the um, heel to petal uh, height will determine this uh, knee block height. Uh, from that measurement, we can consider uh, the lowest of the two, if somebody has an LLD, somebody doesn't have an LLD, no issues. Uh, if somebody is wearing orthosis, again, same principle, we can take the orthosis measurement, process of measurement, or we can add some uh, millimeters to an inch to that. And we'll have to consider the height of the footwear sole to this, we'll have to add that. We'll have to consider the uh, height of the compressed flint portion of the cushion, we'll have to subtract that, from, sorry, we'll have to add that here. We should not subtract it here. For the leg <coughs> foot test height, we'll have to subtract the front cushion compressed height. For the knee block height, we'll have to add the front cushion compressed height. Um, and we'll have to con um, <coughs> we have to, uh, the height comes from uh, the measurement of uh, till the inferior angle of the scapula from the seating, so sitting surface in a, in the posture of which the person ha wants to sit. If somebody has a fixed kyphosis, maybe you cannot correct that posture. If somebody's posture is correctable, kyphotic posture is correctable, then they will gain more height if we create such a device here. So we'll have to take a decision on which height to measure, whether should it be the height of person sitting erect or the person's height uh, without with the kyphosis. So after taking that height, we'll have to consider the height of the compressed rear cushion. So we'll have to add that height to the backrest measurement and we'll have to consider the balance of the person based on that we can increase or decrease the height. We'll have to consider type of usage. So in the assessment, we can uh, collect two sets of data. Uh, how are you going to use this wheelchair? Whether it's going to be a full-time usage or a part-time usage. Somebody is going to use it only for part-time, then probably a lower backrest height should be okay. Because when sitting for long durations, uh, some persons will need more support. It depends on many factors like age, uh, type of whether the person is very active in sports and whether the person has good musculature or if the person is weak or newly injured. So we'll have to take all those considerations and then adjust the height of the backrest.
Next, uh, very similar thing for the backrest angle. Backrest height and backrest angle works in uh, combination with each other, uh, which should be synced with each other. Again, based on the balance and type of usage, we'll have to uh, play with the backrest height and the backrest angle. Next, uh, coming to the knee block distance. Um, so when coming to the knee block distance, it's directly from taken from the inter uh, condylar distance uh, from the person. Uh, there are some considerations. So this one knee block distance will be limited by seat width. So one can have only so much wide of a uh, knee block uh, distance. That is, we mean we in clinical terms we call this abduction. One can have only so much abduction based on the width of the wheelchair because when these move out, no, they will come into contact with the skirt guard while standing because the skirt guard rolls down while a person stands it should not come and hit the knee block so this consideration should be taken very seriously based on the seat width of the person we can choose the knee block so ideal case will be if somebody uh, i'll give an example so one one is a very uh, thin built uh, 14 inch or 15 inch wheelchair uh, sits on a 14 inch or 15 inch wheelchair and the person wants a good amount of abduction that may not be possible so there will be a limitation if somebody is, wants abduction and if abduction is important then seat width then we have to go with a wider uh, wheelchair bigger size wheelchair probably 16 or 17. if somebody's uh, abduction is not important then we can go with the 15 inch or you know, 16 inch wheelchair and other deformities if it's correctable to some extent like wind swept or uh, abduction the legs are in abduction fixed in abduction or the legs are fixed in abduction uh, to some extent, we can correct these issues with the knee block. If then, uh, for example, if the legs are adapted very tight and they cannot be separated to 170 millimeters, which is uh, the minimum in this uh, knee block, then probably that person cannot be fitted. So fitting the knee block uh, distance is a very critical thing for standing purpose. And then we have uh, a rear wheel position. You can see that there are uh, multiple holes but in the final model i assume there's three only three holes so it's active moderate or passive uh it depends on the weight it depends on uh, the wheelie skill whether we want to give active moderate or something uh how the person will perform it also depends on the terrain uh and uh, it depends on the seat depth because here uh, this is a new factor seat depth here no when we adjust seat depth the backrest actually moves back uh, so usually this seat depth when we adjust in other wheelchairs, the seat depth moves to the front and uh, the last one uh, weight oh, assist, which is the spring assist here, yeah? so stand up and sit. Uh, next uh, activity is going to be a live demonstration on the wheelchair. So um, I'll just explain the sheet first. So if you look at it. Uh, C will be uh, what parameters are we go, what parts of the body are we going to evaluate it comes from the assessment and it comes from the measurement and uh, column D will be what things should be considered uh, should we consider uh, orthosis process or the shoe sole height other stuff and the column E will be what should be selected so we measure the right side and left side sometimes and which should be selected the lowest or the highest and uh, column F and G will uh, take the measurement input uh, from the body measurement or whether it's the measurement from the orthosis or process. And the column uh, H and I will tell about the recommendation in terms of orthosis, sorry, body measurement on column H and in terms of orthosis process measurement on column I. So H and I are basically recommendations of what should be done. Should we add uh, some value? Should we, we reduce some value? It can also be custom. What is given here is for as a rule of thumb. And finally, uh, J will tell about whether to add or reduce. K will tell about the final wheelchair dimensions. After we make all the calculations, uh, the column K will tell about uh, uh, what will be the final wheelchair dimensions. So after we write down the dimensions over there, we can take out the prescription form and we can mark the closest value over there. So it's a large mean, it's 17, right? Yes, sir. Okay, we will see one by one considerations one by one. So let's assume the hip width of the person is 16, the mid thigh width of the person is uh, 18, 
and the print i width of the person is uh, maybe 17 which is just an assumption so when this is the case and if the ties cannot be uh, kept very close together maybe due to preference or maybe due to any uh, uh, joint constraints then we'll have to take the uh, measurement of the mid tie the uh, fitment form um, <clears throat> so when we are looking at uh, the measurement we can write the three measurements we can write the measurement of the hip measurement of the mid thigh and measurement of the distal thigh and then if we come to column e so we'll have to select the widest measurement of the three so we can try to uh, adjust the uh, knees uh, closer uh, can the team from mobility india uh, the person sitting on the wheelchair can they can you keep your knees closer yes if the knees are kept closer then now the hip is the widest measurement if say this is not being this is not possible and if the person wants to keep the legs wide apart then we'll have to take the measurement of the mid thigh otherwise uh, we can take whatever is the widest so this has to be taken uh, in the preferred form from the user and based on the assessments which we have done so we can write three measurements hip mid thigh and distal thigh and select the widest of the three measurements then we'll have to uh, come to see whether the person uses an orthosis or prosthesis. So next we'll go to the uh, consideration of using orthosis or prosthesis. So we can write down the measurements of without the orthosis, hip, mid thigh and distal thigh and with the orthosis of the measurement hip, with mid thigh and distal thigh. And whatever is the widest measurement, we can go ahead with that if the knees are not able to come together. So next consideration will be to add or reduce some things from here. If there is recent noticeable weight gain, if the, weight, if the person has not put on any weight in the last six months, uh, then we should not be worried. Uh, if the person puts on weight uh, in the last three months, and if it is increasing in the thigh area where the seat width will be compromised, then we can uh, add some value to this, add some value to whatever we had earlier recorded. Uh, to the widest value which we are already recorded, we can add half an inch uh, to that. And it can even go to uh, uh, one inch if there's a need, if uh, the person is sure that there was a weight loss and now the person is gaining a weight, we can, minimum we will have to add a half an inch. So maximum we can add one inch. So that is uh, the first consideration to be uh, done. And uh, next consideration is if somebody had a uh, recurrent ulcer in, at the greater trochanter region in the past, uh, sorry, uh, in the past, and if it's on, only on one side, uh, we can add half an inch. So this will be an incremental thing. If we, we would have already added half an inch for the increase in weight, and then we'll have to add one more half an inch if there's a great, recurrent greater trochanter ulcer. So we're just going to see what will happen uh, if uh the extra half inch is not added mr karthik uh, can you just place your hand beside your greater trochanter beside your hip bone uh, so if uh the uh, width extra width is not given for the weight increase in weight or in uh, presence of the uh, path pressure ulcer and then the skirt guard will erode it is made of metal and it it might have some uh, paint peeling off on something that area will keep on eroding so when that movement happens exactly so that's what will happen that will keep on eroding uh, the skin that movement will happen and uh, if there's a gap it will not come into contact with the person so uh, when there is a path pressure ulcer, that means that area is prone to have a pressure ulcer in the future if subjected to the same risk so we should not that area will be kind of delicate so we should give extra gap that an inch. If the pressure ulcer was on both of the body on the greater trochanters, then we can add one inch to the measurement. So if it is single side, uh, then the person can actually go to one side while standing. If it's double side, then we'll have to have one one more inch of uh, addition over there to the and then there is uh, thick clothing. If somebody wears a thick clothing like a, a sweater pant or um, or loose clothing, if somebody wants to wear a sari and if they are not able to control that, uh, then we can uh, add uh, one inch to that value. 
or whatever thick clothing value, uh, whatever thick cloth, what is the whatever value of the thick clothing which they'll be using. So if it's a very loose clothing like a skirts or sarees, then we can comfortably add one inch. If it's going to be sweater pants, which is going to increase the width, uh, it's we can add uh, one inch comfortably or the thickness of the sweater. If that is not done, again the same issue will happen. This time the injury will not be to, due to the skin. What will happen is all the sweater or the woolen clothing or this loose clothing, you know, they will get caught on the sides of the skirt guard. So you can see the inside of the skirt guard, it has some holes, it has uh, some gaps. They will catch the clothing if it is touching the skirt guard. It can be woolen clothing, it can be other clothing and they will harm the person. So they'll, uh, while standing, it can be harmful if the clothes are caught. It's always better to leave extra gap. So what we recommend is a minimum of one inch for loose clothing and the sweaters also same thing will apply or if somebody wears a sweater only then whatever measurement of the sweater can be added over so finally when we come to uh, the last column k so uh, so we we would have considered uh, we would have uh, uh, considered many things so first is we would have taken the widest measurement of all the three areas of the body uh, widest of the hip uh, mid thigh or distal thigh and then we would have uh, taken the virus of the calipers or process or process if somebody wants to use with that that is number second to that measurement we would have added <coughs> uh, we would have added uh, half an inch if it was a recent weight gain we would have uh, <coughs> we would have added half an inch if it was a uh, recurrent one-sided greater to counter ulcer which is currently healed we would have added one inch to this measurement if it was a bilateral decorant greater to counter ulcer we would have uh, added one inch if the clothing if the person wears loose clothing and the person has to wear loose clothing so finally whatever we have added and uh, we can calculate that and see and the measurement which comes there no? we'll have to uh, look for that closest measurement in the prescription form so the measurement <coughs> we'll have to make a judgment out there so uh, based on safe, uh, let me open the prescription form. So we have four options. So based on the measurement which we, based on the calculation which we uh, have uh, uh, got from the fitting process in the wheelchair, based on the various considerations which we added, and based on the width of the person, we can select the closest uh, seat size here. So it can be small, medium, or excel. What I would recommend is always go for the larger size because having it a bit wider is good for safety purpose. It may be bad for propulsion, but it's good for safety. And this is primarily designed for standing, so it's not meant to replace a regular active wheelchair. It's, so safety should be the first concern over here. So what I would recommend is always go for the highest, higher value than what we have received. Uh, we can take a clean, uh, subject to clinical judgment based on if we want to go lower. If it's very less, difference is very less, say five millimeters, then we can always go lower than the machine. So I will go to the uh, next part. So next fitment will be looking at fitting the uh, person with the correct seat depth in the wheelchair. We'll have to take the thigh length measurement on the left side and the thigh length measurement on the right side. So this measurement is from uh, the posterior uh, most part of the body till the popliteal fossa. And uh, if somebody wears an orthosis or prosthesis, then uh, that measurement has to be taken while the person is being measured or we can add some more extra value. And if somebody has an LLD, we can take up to 25 millimeters. So all the, uh, so we can take up to uh, LLD up to one inch. If the difference is uh, less, one inch or lesser, then we can take that person for using a raised standing wheelchair. The difference is uh, more than that, uh, probably it will be difficult to use. In a regular wheelchair, it should be fine because there's no standing function. Because here the standing function, the posture will be distorted significantly so, so if the difference is more than one inch or 25 millimeters then we'll have to tell them it's uh, we regret um, so when the measurement is lower than one inch we can take the lowest uh, thigh of uh, uh, between the left and right and record that measurement it can be either the body measurement or it can be the measurement of the orthosis or processes uh, so can I ask Mr. Karthik to sit on the wheelchair so that we can show what clearance we are talking about. So the measurement will be taken till there and we'll have to reduce. Only if you reduce, we can see that gap which Mr. Raju is showing over there. So if that gap is not there, 
then the person will not be able to sit erect like how we are sitting now. So there will be a lot of uh, uh, posterior pelvic tilt and the person will have a very slouch posture and uh, the person uh, there will be some kind of uh, injury. There can be some kind of injury in the knee space and uh, the person's pressure point will shift a lot to the tailbone area. So this gap is very essential for the seat depth and uh, what we'll have to take the lowest limb length, lowest thigh length and reduce 25 millimeters from that with or without the orthosis or processes. So I hope this is clear. This is a fairly simple one. We'll have to take, if there is limb length discrepancy more than one inch, then we cannot take the person. If there's limb length discrepancy less than one inch, we can take that person. We'll have to take the uh, length of the lowest uh, thigh and then reduce 25 millimeters from that or one inch from that and then confirm the seat depth so that final value can be written in the end of the sheet on column k and we can go to the prescription form and choose that value from there so in the prescription form we have three uh, seat depths 425 millimeters or 17 inches 455 millimeters or close to 18 inches and 485 millimeters or 19 inches so based on the person's uh, <clears throat> value which we would have arrived in the fitment form we can choose from either of three and we can put a tick mark over there. So next moving on to the third component, which is the knee block length. Uh, the measurement again, which is very similar to a seat depth measurement. Uh, we would have uh, taken the measurement from the popliteal, sorry, uh, the most part of the body till the uh, patella uh, kneecap. And uh, from that value, we're not adding or reducing anything. We're just considering LLD, aluminum discrepancy. So if there is LLD uh, one inch or lesser or 25 millimeters or lesser, we can definitely take that person and uh, do some modification to fit that person in the wheelchair. If it's more than one inch, then we cannot make that person use this wheelchair. And if the per person wears orthosis processes, uh, again, uh, we can take the measurement directly from there or add some value uh, to this. Uh, probably uh, add a half an inch or one inch to that based on what kind of orthosis process they're wearing. And the selection for here is if there is an LLD less than one inch, we'll have to select the highest or the longest measurement. Uh, so the <coughs> uh, thigh measurement, no? So we'll have to select the longest measurement because if we select the shorter measurement, then the knee block will not fit on the longer leg. So if you select the longer measurement, uh, the knee block can be fitted to the longer limb and the gap on the shorter limb can be filled up. So we can uh, see the demonstration now. So you can have the knee block over there. Mr. Karthik, can you sit on one side, maybe one knee front and one knee back so that we can visualize an LLD? Yeah, this is a little bit exaggerated, but uh, this is what will happen if there's an LLD. So we'll have to <coughs> adjust the knee block to the longest limb and in the shorter limb, we'll have a gap. So in that gap, we can actually fill some pads. Uh, this can be done only up to one inch so that optimal pressure is achieved. So when, when the person is standing, the knee block will be compressing the knee area. And if the contact is only on one knee, there'll be all the pressure of the knee block will go onto only one knee and the skin can be injured and it's a bony area. Uh, so it is highly risky. Uh, so if the pressure is, the whole point is to keep the pressure optimized on both the knees. So we can see on the left side of the uh, person uh, left side of Mr. Karthik, the knee block is fitted correctly. On the right side, there's some gap, at least two to three fingers gap between the knee and the knee block. So there we can make a modification. Yeah, there's two finger gap. So, so we can make uh, one inch of a soft padding of the same density of foam, and we can fit it out there with Velcros or maybe we can glue it, or we can change the whole knee block. That will be some extra customization, which has to be uh, probably done on the field. So based on uh, the measurement which we uh, arrive after, <coughs> uh, which we get uh, from the longest uh, knee length, we can choose the uh, knee block uh, length in the prescription form. There are four lengths available, 580 millimeters, 580 millimeters, 600 and 610. So it goes, it starts at 580 and it has a four steps adjustment in increments of 10 millimeters or one centimeter. So we can uh, mark whatever uh, size of knee length we need in the knee block. Yeah. Next, going on to the uh, footrest height. Uh, so the measurement which we will be taking from the person will be the 
uh, leg length uh, on the left side and leg length on the right side, leg length or height. And uh, here, uh, before anything, if the person wears shoes, we'll have to record that measurement and we'll have to add that measurement. So it will come from uh, the assessment. So when we uh, measure a person or when we assess the person, we'll have to ask them to come with the shoes or sandals which are used very frequently. Um, so this height will be needed. If we don't consider that height uh, during uh, the measurement and during fitment, the, if we fit the wheelchair according to the bare leg height and if they wear shoes, there will be a gap below the front of the thigh. So Mr. Karthik, can you just plant a flex your foot so that there's some gap below your thigh? Yeah. Yeah. So if we fit the uh, leg footrest height without the foot, considering the footwear height, without adding the footwear height, and if we the person wears footwear after sitting on the wheelchair, there will be such a gap, and such a gap is not good for uh, good posture or good pressure distribution, and it will also have a problem when standing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I can see clearly a uh, two finger gap below that. Okay, so shoes hold. And if the person wears orthosis process, it's better to take the measurement with them. And it will not be a, it will be a very rare case only if somebody wants to use the standing measure with orthosis or prosthesis. And here also we can consider limb length leg length discrepancy up to 25 millimeters or one inch. And uh, so here we can uh, take the uh, uh, highest uh, limb length, sorry, lowest limb length and what we can do is uh, the higher limb will have some gap like uh, how Mr. Uh, the Kartik and Mr. Rajo demonstrated the higher limb will have some gap there we can fill some pad below the seat cushion on one side only so that uh, uh, the seat cushion has good contact there's no gap below the thigh so that is the case if someone has a limb and discrepancy in the legs and if somebody uses a partial support device, it's very similar to shoes. We'll have to just add that measurement before uh, we complete the, uh, before we calculate the complete uh, wheelchair dimension. And uh, here, uh, we'll have to uh, reduce the uh, compressed cushion height. So after this, we'll have to add the height of the compressed uh, cushion on the front side. Uh, <coughs> so. Mr. Karthik is sitting on the cushion and after sitting it is compressed to some extent. We can uh, take the measurement for uh, the cushion which comes with the standing wheelchair. Uh, by default, we will be uh, having a default value according to the weight and that can uh, be uh, subtracted. <coughs> but if a person wants to use a different cushion, then we'll have to enter the customized value over there. So we'll have to subtract this value to get the correct uh, footrest height. We'll have to go to the prescription form and uh, select the footrest height. So there are four positions available in increments of 20 millimeters. It starts from 330 millimeters and this 350, this 370 and 390. So based on uh, whatever value it comes as the final value based on a calculation, we can use that measurement. Next, moving on to the uh, footrest angle in relation to the floor. We'll have to take only two measurements here, uh, ankle range of motion on the left and ankle range of motion on the right. Uh, <coughs> If someone has, uh, sorry, first we'll have to take the range of motion of the lowermost measurement. Uh, if someone uh, has a, um, a fixed a contracture uh, or fixed deformity in the ankle, uh, like uh, Mr. Karthik, can you show plantar flexion equinus in the foot? Yes. So what we can do here now, we can, the uh, only possibility of correcting this is to uh, add a wedge below the shoe so that uh, the leg of the person remains stable while, <coughs> while it's standing. And this also should be evaluated carefully based on clinical judgment, we'll have to do it because if the ankle is tight, if it's not only the if the ankle joints are also tight, on standing it may cause uh, some harmful uh, effects on the person's joints. It can be uh, some mild, uh, uh, damage can happen uh, like swelling or some major damage can happen like some ligament tears or something. So this easy solution is to provide a, a wedge below the foot and then uh, make the uh, feet flat. So basically we are trying to improve the increase the contact of the foot.
to the uh, foot rest so that is done but if the angle is very stiff and if the angle is more then we'll have to uh, take a decision over there and probably not give yeah correct so we'll have to add a triangular portion over there the thinner portion will be on the front and the thicker portion will be on the back again after doing this if there's a gap below the thigh again we'll have to fill that gap and if that's a description discrepancy while standing if the pelvis is tilted to one side if one pelvis is up and all pelvis is down then we'll have to add some more supports to the other leg as well so a change in one place will be kind of a it will have an effect like a chain so we'll have to correct it multiple places so that we'll see it during checkup so based on uh, uh, whether the footrest uh, angle is optimal or non optimal we can opt for uh, having footrest partial support devices see, I, at this point i think it has to be custom made uh, i don't think there's any default option or factor fitted option right now <coughs> based on whether it is uh, inversion or reversion deformity or whether it is uh, uh, dorsiflexion or plantar flexion dorsiflexion or plantar flexion deformity <coughs> we can uh, make a partial support device like how uh, mr karthik had demonstrated some time back so mr karthik uh, can you uh, invert your foot your right foot yeah yeah so uh, this is too much can you reduce it a little can you make it a little bit closer to yeah that's better so now, now we can see the edge of the outer edge of the uh, foot uh, on the foot plate so this is not a good thing because easily the foot can uh, roll and cause an injury or the pressure will be more on the edge of the foot while it's support while it's bearing the weight the feet, uh, the feet bear all the weight from the body while standing so this has to be the pressure has to be made even if the foot is not yielding to neutral we'll have to add a wedge on the inside of the foot so thicker will in the inside of the foot and it will be thinner on the outside of the foot so mr karthik can you turn pressing the camera so that it's visible from the front okay uh i think we can see clearly that there is a gap between the sole of the foot and the foot plate on the uh, inside of the foot plate yes there's a gap yeah thank you very much so white background shows it clearly yes so this gap has to be filled uh, with the partial support device on the foot rest or the footwear can be modified so that the contact is flat and this also we'll have to take a judgment on how, what extent do you want because if we we cannot over correct this or we cannot correct a deformity which is uh, very severe uh, it will end up in a risk to the ankle so i marked it and uh, we'll have to add this height to the footrest height this can be again if there's a, such a need it can be written as a, a custom need in the prescription uh, sheet or we can opt it to uh, customize it ourselves wherever we work on the field also next uh, will be the uh, knee block height uh, so for this uh, we will take the measurement of the leg height from the uh, heel till the uh, patella or the patella tendon so once that measurement is entered here uh, we can again we'll have to take the longest or the tallest measurement of these uh, two so mr karthik can you raise one knee up yeah so let's assume that uh, right knee is uh, taller than the left knee so let us not consider the gap there so right knee is taller so the knee block has to be uh, approximated so that gap we will fill later so the gap between thigh we will fill it later so the knee block has to be approximated to the <coughs> right knee which is taller the top edge of the knee block should be uh, yes exactly at the patella tendon for the leg which is lower we can always fill it up with foam pad so that it matches so the measurement the prescription has to be selected the height on the prescription has to be selected according to the taller knee on the shorter knee we'll be filling it with foam pads
and if someone wears an orthostatic prosthesis again that measurement can be taken and uh, to this uh, measurement uh, got to uh, add the height of the front cushion front uh, yeah, compressed height of the front cushion yes so the knee block is there in place so uh, first we'll take the measurement uh, we'll see whether there's a discrepancy in length or not if there's a discrepancy within uh, one inch then it's fine to go ahead if it's more than one inch then we'll not go ahead uh, so if there's a discrepancy then the measurement should be taken to the uh, we should select the measurement of the highest knee and uh, on the highest knee the knee block will be set and for the lower knee which is uh lower the which which is like not approximated to the top of the knee block we can raise the height of the lower leg by introducing foam pads bit, uh, below the feet or on top of the footrest so that way both the knees will be at the same level and after we get this measurement we will have to add the height of the compressed front cushion to this value yes now now it's same now it's at the same level we are yeah we are putting the knee block on so the height if we can see on the left and right side there are multiple holes we can increase this height based on uh, the height of the based on a measurement the top of the knee block should come in level or it should be in the same line as the patellar tendon all base of the kneecap yes so we can see uh, the left knee is higher than the right knee so okay so now there's a foam pad there's a pad kept below the uh, left foot to make it at the same level yes as a so such kind of support can be kept on top of the footrest or can be added to the footwear to make both the legs at the same level so the knee block is approximate yes again this has to be checked again in standing so that the pelvis is not tilted to one side so after we uh, calculate all the considerations and the measurement we can go to the prescription sheet and we can select the uh, <coughs> sorry we can select the knee block height it is uh, number 6 uh, we have uh, five uh, increments here each in uh, 10 millimeters we have 420 millimeters 430 440 450 and 460 we have five increments in a five uh, steps of measurement in uh, each of uh, 10 millimeters of difference so you can select either of these values based on uh, the value which we had uh, finally you receive uh, got after calculation so next we'll go to the uh, back height or the backrest height so the measurement which we'll be using here will be the uh, measurement we uh, did with the person's back uh, we have taken two measurements back height on the left and back height on the right uh, so if there is no difference we can proceed with that measurement directly if there's a difference then we'll have to uh, take the measurement of the lowermost height yeah thank you so can can uh, any one of you place their finger on the inferior angle of the scapula of Mr. Karthik? Yes. Okay. So we'll be taking the measurement over there and then we can have the backrest height higher or lower. Probably not higher than that point, but maybe lower than that point based on the type of activity and based on <clears throat> whatever uh, balance or uh, yeah, measurement we get so here we'll be we have created a table for ease of use so in the prescription sheet uh, we can go to the next sheet in the excel sheet called guide table so first sheet is called calculation sheet and the next sheet is called guide table so there if we see uh, we have the uh, fitment uh, table guide table for backrest height and backrest angle so if you see in the prescription we have uh, two measurements so we have uh, position one which is 420 millimeters from the seat this is without cushion and position two which is 500 millimeters from the seat without any cushion 
So 420 will be like 17 inches and 500 will be like uh, 20 inches. So it's either 17 inch back this right or 20 inch back this right. So the same backrest is flipped and that's how it's adjusted. We are two backrest right and we are three backrest angles. Five degrees of uh, inclination, uh, or the, sorry, five degrees of reclining, 12.5 degrees of reclining or 20 degrees of reclining. So this is with respect to the uh, floor and not with respect to the seat. So now Mr. Karthik is sitting on a very erect backrest, which is five degrees of inclination. Uh, so if there is 12.5 12 degrees, it will be even more, he'll be sitting even more slant. Mr. Karthik, can you little, come a little bit front and then lean a lot to the backrest? Yeah. Yeah, let's assume this. Can you go a little bit back? This is too much. Can you go a little bit back? Yeah. Let's assume this is 12.5 degrees of backrest angle. And if you can sit, come a little bit front, even more lean. Yeah. Let's assume this to be 20 degrees of inclination. So this is too much, but uh, so this is how the backrest angle will change. The most erect backrest angle will be 5 degrees, and then some more lean will be 12.5 degrees. Even more lean will be 20 degrees. All this is uh, with the respect to the floor. So erect, uh, we, zero degrees, otherwise it's, it's, we can take it as 90 degrees. So this can be 95 degrees, and then we can have 90, uh, 102.5 degrees, and then we can have 110 degrees. So if it's perpendicular to the floor, we can have it as zero or 90. I'll just talk in terms of zero. If it's perpendicular floor, it's zero. If it's slightly lean back, it's five degrees. If it's, uh, if it's, leaned even more back, it is 12.5 degrees. And if it's leaned way back, it's 20 degrees. Yeah, the adjustments are present over there. We can just remove some screws and tilt the back. Okay, so let's go back to the fitment sheet on the guide table. So we saw that there are two backrest right and three backrest angle uh, uh, settings available. So in the table, uh, if you look at column B, we have the measurement. So the lowest measurement, and if there's a difference on left and right sides of the backrest, uh, then we'll have to take the lowest measurement. So based on the measurement, and based on whether the balance is fair or poor, and based on whether the usage is part-time or full-time, we have given the angle and the position. Say for example, <clears throat> the person's measurement is 410 degrees. And if the balance is fair and poor, and if the person is going to use it for part-time, then the backrest height can be in position one, and the backrest angle can be in 12.5. So this is in consideration after adding the compressed height of the rear part of the cushion. So if we are working with the default cushion, which will be sent to the wheelchair, then we can go ahead with this table directly. If we are changing the cushion, or if you plan to change this, do some modification of the cushion, then that value has to be added or reduced with this. So if it's thinner than the um, standing wheelchair cushion, then it has to be uh, reduced. If the cushion is thicker than the standing wheelchair cushion, then it has to be increased. So based on the measurement which you receive, which is in column B, based on the balance and the type of usage, we can choose the appropriate, uh, <clears throat> appropriate uh, angle and the position. So if, say, if Mr. Karthik uh, has very less balance and if the, Mr. Karthik is uh, kind of uh, tall and if Mr. Karthik is uh, planned to sit on the wheelchair for a very long time, then we'll have to make the backrest taller. Uh, can someone place the hand a little bit higher on Mr. Karthik's back? Yeah, yeah. so it will not be that tall, but it will be slightly taller. So, so. No, 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 not even tall. So yeah, little bit different, little bit taller from the existing backrest height. So it will be somewhere over there, hoping that what we have there is lower backrest height. And if Mr. Karthik, again, same thing, balance is poor uh, or balance is fair. And if we see to plan for more or longer, and if he's uh, kind of very tall person, the backrest angle will also be more. So the way to use this table is, on first column B, we'll have to select the measurement. And on the right side, we'll have to select the appropriate 
uh, usage and the balance. So if uh, fair than poor than part time usage, we can select uh, column C and D. If it's fair than poor than full time usage, we can select column. We can take the value from column F and G. If it's good and normal part time usage, we can select values from I and J. If it's good and normal and full time usage, we can select the values from L and M. Again, to reiterate, this can be used as a rule of thumb for someone who is not having very experienced fitting process. Uh, advanced uh, professionals, professionals who are very uh, advanced and very experienced in fitting, can go with their uh, own uh, experience. So, ultimately, the checkout is the one which will tell us uh, whether the backrest height and angle is correct or not. So going to the prescription form, after we select the backrest height and angle, we can select the 420 millimeters or 500 millimeters. And then we can select <coughs> what angle we want uh, with respect to floor, 5 degrees, 12 degrees, or 20 degrees. Next, we'll move to the uh, inter knee block distance. In the prescription sheet on uh, item number 10, we have, uh, we will, for inter knee block distance, we'll be taking the measurement of the intercondylar distance, the distance between the two knees of the person and uh, here we will not have any uh, LLD related issue. The consideration is we will have other uh, deformities uh, like if there is a windswept deformity or if there is an abduction deformity or an adduction deformity. So we will, we'll, uh, Mr. Karthik, can you keep both your necks close together, knocked, both your knees knocked together? Okay, this is an example of an adduction. If the knees are not able to kept wide apart, if someone is not if we are having a lot of difficulty from spreading them, like when we do the mat assessment, then we'll have to choose, uh, we'll have to take the measurement uh, between the knees and we'll have to see whether it will fit in the measurement. Usually this will not be a problem creating scenario because a person can sit on a wider wheelchair and uh, still have very uh, 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 what's it, uh, narrow knee block. This will not be an issue. What will be the issue is uh, if the knees cannot be separated at all. We, we need the hips, uh, the knees and the feet to be in a fairly straight line. When looking from the front, no, when the person is standing, Mr. Karthik, can you get off from the wheelchair and stand separately beside it? So assume Mr. Karthik is standing on the standing wheelchair. So uh, the hips, um, uh, knees and the feet should be on a fairly straight line. If you have a measuring tape with you, you can drop the machine tape from your belt line. Yeah, that should be, that will give us more clarity. So yes, if we draw an imaginary line over there, it should be fairly straight. Uh, if we have a person with an adduction deformity and if the person sits in a wider wheelchair, so it will be like Z, so it will be like a uh, uh, bow legs. So hips will be wider, knees will be closer and uh, the legs will be wider. We don't want that to happen. So there will be a lot of pressure on the uh, outside of the knee. Yes. So can can you demonstrate bow legs, Mr. Karthik? With the knees knocked together, can you stand a little bit? Yeah, yeah, correct. So if the knees, no, the opposite, the first one which you did. Yeah, correct. So when you place the meshing tape now, now we can find that it's not straight. The hip and the feet are on the same line, but the knee is slightly inward. <coughs> This is not a good position to have on the standing wheelchair. And um, if the knees are not able to be separated with a, a moderate amount of force, then we'll have to say that we cannot, uh, the wheelchair is not suitable for the person. If the knees can be separated, then fine, we can go out with it. So based on how much space is available between the knees, we can add that to the uh, intercondylar distance. Okay. Uh, now, Mr. Karthik, uh, can you sit on the wheelchair? So we will see uh, two more cases of uh, uh, how the knee alignment can go away from the hips and the feet. So because the hips are fixed, hips cannot be more. Knees are fixed because the footrest holds the knees, sorry, uh, feet, footrest holds the feet. Uh, the knee is the only part which has to be more left and right. So there is another case which is called a windswept. So uh, Mr. Karthi, can you keep one leg out and one leg in, so one knee outside and one knee inside? This is, yeah, this is windswept. Okay, I think last time Mr. Karthik had uh, explained it very well. So, uh, the right knee is very close towards the midline, the left knee is away from the midline. Again, 
if we cannot correct this if we cannot stretch the knees and keep them in place using the knee block uh, then yeah thank you so with the machine tape you can see that it's not in a straight line so if it's difficult to separate the knees and keep them in place using the knee block uh, then <clears throat> uh it it will be uh, difficult for the person to stand if this difference is very mild if we, we can stretch it uh say if, can you put the knee block on yes so here the knee block is on uh say we are trying to stretch uh, the right knee of the uh, mr karthik to right side and left knee of mr karthik uh, to again to the right side so we are trying to do that it should not if it's inseparable then we cannot give the wheelchair if it's correctable to some extent and if there's a lot of pressure we should check for pressure on the inside of the knee block so a lot of pressure we can slightly offset this so in in our sheet uh, what we have is uh, for the mild we not we need not change anything it can be in the uh, exact midline uh, symmetrical position knee block can be symmetrical position if it's moderate then we can uh, move it 5 mm uh, offset so now in this image we what in this uh, video field what we can see is mr karthik's right knee is going towards the center and left knee is going away from center so the knee block can go 5 mm away from the center from its existing position 5 mm to the uh, left and 5 mm to the uh, left on both sides okay so while adjusting knee block Okay, we can create an offset here. So the knee block will move five millimeters. It will not be symmetrical. It will not be having the same distance from the skirt guard uh, on left and right sides. So the left knee block will go five millimeters closer to the left skirt guard, and right knee block will go away by five millimeters from the right skirt guard. Okay. So this is the case when there is a moderate windsurf deformity. If it's mild, no need to change anything. If it's severe, then regret. Next, if we have abduction deformity very similar thing uh, mr karthik can you try to bring your knees little bit closer yeah no not too close not too wide medium moderate yeah yeah this is the most neutral position one can get uh, so uh, from abduction from when the next when the wide spread wide apart from abduction if you are trying to bring it in neutral and if it takes only mild amount of force if it's easily correctable then we not we need not move uh, the knee block uh, any wider or any another one we can just give it based on the distance present between the knees for the seat size if it is kind of difficult uh, to move the knees closer to this neutral position so the legs want to stay wide apart mr karthik can you abduct the legs yeah if the legs always want to stay wide apart like this if you are having very moderate amount of we need only moderate amount of force to bring them close together then we can consider moving the knee block uh, 5 mm on the outsides on both sides for the windsurf it more 5 mm on one direction for the abduction deformity it takes only moderate amount of uh, correction so the knee block can move 5 mm outside on the right and 5 mm outside on the left so there is some balance between it's not too abducted it's not too adducted it's not neutral so <clears throat> that's for the knee block we saw adduction we saw wind swept and we saw uh, <clears throat> abduction so for mild no change for moderate 5 mm left uh, outside or inside or uh, on one side offset uh, if it's uh, difficult to move if it's very tight then i think that we cannot i will say the wheelchair will not fit that person and uh, here the thing is we'll have to measure how much the knee block can go outside uh, for a small uh, size wheelchair <coughs> or 15 inches so it can go only to 170 mm cannot more, go more than that because uh, mm. the knee block will hit the skirt guard we'll see all that in check out <coughs> so based on the num final number which we uh, which we calculate here we can go to the <clears throat> prescription sheet and see the knee block into knee block distance we can write the exact amount of knee block distance which we need there are no options here it's a free movement so whatever measurement we receive uh, based on keeping the knees neutral we can write that measurement in the prescription sheet 
so now let's move on to the rear wheel position uh, this is uh, fairly simple so if you can see the wheel axle there are some holes in the left and right sides of it uh, how many holes are there three or five you can show your finger <coughs> five okay 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 so okay great so i think mostly uh, only the first three will be usable four and five will be very passive it may not be suitable for anyone so first three can be used first one can be the active most it may not be active as a rigid frame wheelchair uh, or an active wheelchair so it, first hole will be active most second will be moderate third will be passive and four and five we can term it as very very passive or very passive so for this also uh, we have a table weight table we will consider three things weight of the user uh, we will consider the wheelie skill we will consider the seat depth so if we can go to the fitment form and uh, if we can go to the guide table uh, so it's almost in the last uh, almost we can scroll down almost to the last the end of the sheet uh, where we have a table called rear wheel position so basically we are going to move the wheel a little bit front or a little bit back so this wheel cannot be removed so we cannot show that uh, so the whole wheel will shift to maybe 20 millimeters in front or 20 millimeters in the back if needed so the weight of the person the weight of the head arm trunk and the hips will should fall directly above the axle for most of the cases so in the table what we have is for the particular we have seat depth in the column b we have weight of the person in column c we have a wheelie skill in the column d and the rear wheel position which we have to choose in column f so we have written only for uh, three uh, positions this is considering stability also say for the person uh, who has a seat depth of 425 millimeters or the shortest seat depth for that particular weight range for that particular wheelie skill uh, we can find whether it can be front or whether it can be middle or whether or whether it can be uh, back uh, in column f so based on the seat depth in the first column based on the weight on the second column based on the uh, really skill in third column we can find the correct rear wheel position on the uh, column f or the right right column okay so what this will do is this will keep the uh, wheel directly uh, below the person so the wheel is in front of the person center of gravity then uh, doing a wheelie will be easier it can be recommended for experienced users or it can be recommended for uh, people good amount of training uh, people with uh, people who are living in very rough terrain so, uh, so people who are sorry people who are living uh, not in rough terrain and uh, people who don't require a lot of stability so this wheelchair you see it doesn't have an anti tipper because there's a lot of weight in the front it's difficult to lift and fall back but still we should be careful so initially during the training phase we can have it in a moderate or the passive setting and then after the person progresses we can move this this is <coughs> this wheel position affects two things one is the wheelchair maneuverability the wheel position is very active then turning will be easier and uh, doing wheelies will be easier propulsion will be easier uh, and if it is way back it's better for standing so because the wheel base is longer distance between front wheel and the back wheel if it's longer if it's more uh, then the person will not have any risk of falling back or falling front and also while propulsion the risk of falling back will be reduced so basically this table can be used as a rule of thumb and we can uh, take the seat depth, weight, wheelie and find out the rear wheel position. I have written only, uh, we have written only three based on our experience. So if needed, we can also have the fourth and fifth rows. Okay, so now, uh, so in the prescription sheet, uh, what we have written is only three positions, one, two, three based on whatever position which is given in the table or whatever we select, we can mark it in the prescription sheet. We can write one, two or three. Or if something custom is needed, we can write four or five. And uh, the last thing will be uh, weight assist. So here we are going to measure only the weight of the user and we can go directly to the guide table. Uh, we can see. Uh, so there are two rows. One is 
the weight of the person and the top uh, row on top of it will tell about how many millimeters of travel uh, is to be has to be adjusted in the gas spring. <clears throat> so I think the gas spring is calibrated in terms of lines. So we'll be having lines which say about 0, 0 0.5, 1, 5, 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5. So it's the caliber, the markings are in uh, 0.5 millimeters in increments. So we have up to seven millimeters of travel. And based on the weight, we can keep that uh, gas spring setting and it will be fairly good. So, uh, if a lot of accidents will then setting will be difficult. So a person can, if the person is becoming stronger based using the standing mechanism, then they can use more of the arm strength compared to the wheelchair's weight assist. So this is the very direct thing. So based on the weight of the person, weight range of the person, you can select the mark, uh, <coughs> setting of the gas spring and write it down in the prescription. If, if you had already received the wheelchair, probably you can locate the uh, weight assist on the wheelchair, the other portion of the wheelchair. Maybe Mr. Karthik, you can get up from the wheelchair and turn the wheelchair back. We can show the weight assist. Yeah, it should be somewhere here below. So it will be visible uh, in the standing position, to be easily visible in the standing position. So there'll be a spring uh, which is tightened or loosened. So based on that, the effort of the wheelchair given to the person standing will increase or decrease based on the weight range. Okay, so we, we have uh, come to uh, the end of uh, fitting process. So now Manish went to standing position to show the weight assist to others. So the weight assist is adjusted according to the weight of the person. So that will help them in from sitting to standing position and coming back to sitting. Um, Nishanti, you can ask uh, Manish to come back to sitting. Yeah, he'll come back to sitting. So then we can move on to the next section.